Good morning, Calvary United Methodist Church. We are so glad to have you here with us once again as we join together collectively in our different places and spaces to open our hearts and gather in worship, praising God, offering our gratitude, and celebrating the way in which God is working in our lives. I got kicked out of the chair. Larry, I got your chair last week and now I am relegated to a different one. They're all the same and they're all uncomfortable, so it doesn't matter to me. But we are, I'm glad to be back with you this morning. I thank you for sticking with us last week in our mistake. And I appreciate the encouragement and the feedback we got for what we were able to do on Sunday morning live. Hopefully, for those of you who don't join us on Facebook, you've been able to watch on YouTube and, and you were able to kind of worship with us I again extend my gratitude for those folks in the choir and the musicians and the technical people who are uh, who joined with us on Sunday and helped us do that. Uh, so we're very grateful for that opportunity. And now we are back together in this place and Larry is with us. Larry, are there a few things that you would like to offer and share with the church this morning? Well, I, I think first of all, the, the congregation, many know this, who when we've been able to be together, uh, on a regular basis in face-to-face -face worship, there are many Sundays that you wish you could go back and redo. <laughs> so, um, and, and this team kept me out of that circle completely. I didn't have to worry or know what was going on, which was just wonderful for me and my family. And so I come back and they're both calling me and going, oh, you need to know, <laughs> we had a redo. And I watched everything. It was wonderful. So thank you, the two of you, the choir, the tech team, everybody who was so willing to come back and, uh, and redo uh, a wonderful service. So, and today we're going to pick up kind of where we were going to be last week with the whole theme of prayer. And so that brings me to a final note, uh, Kelly, that I'd like to share personally. For all of your calls, your, your wonderful, wonderful, prayerful cards, and, and all the text messages, and all the support for my family and for myself, I truly thank you. It was a very difficult week, <laughs> saying goodbye to your mom, <laughs> and a great service at Christ United Methodist Church, where she was a faithful member for over 50 years. And so we had a, a, a wonderful sending forth and sending off and entering the church eternal. And so a big thank you to all of you here at Calvary and Calvary's extended family, all of which were so supportive. So thanks, Kelly. A few announcements that I do want to let you know of so that you can be thinking about it. First of all, as part of my work at Calvary, Karen has introduced me, well Karen and Jamie have introduced me to our church directory system and the software that you can get in. And some of your information is not updated. And we know it's been like six, six months since we've been together and some of you maybe have new phone numbers, maybe new emails, maybe new addresses. And so I'm just asking you if there are any, if there is any updated information for your contact stuff, please let us know. You know, shoot Jamie an email at the church office or shoot me an email or Larry uh, and just let us know that you have a new cell phone number or you're not using your landline anymore or you moved and you bought a bigger house or you downsized, all that information so that we can make sure we're updating. I am, I am upping the communications game and sending some more emails and I wanna make sure that everybody stays connected. So please let us know if there's a way that we can connect you that you're not already receiving it. That would be helpful. And then finally, I uh, went uh, live on Facebook. I've started going live on the Calvary Facebook page. I've never done this before. But I went live yesterday because I was inspired to give a shout out to our teachers. We are in the midst of a very confusing school year and for the students for the teachers for the school administrators for the parents for the people living in the community there are a whole lot of unknowns and a whole lot of difficult circumstances and we know that we get that every year in, in my previous appointment at the beginning of the school year we do something called a blessing of the backpacks where we invite the kids to bring their backpacks in and we say prayers for them as they head into a new school year well we can't invite you in yet and you probably won't be using backpacks if you're going to school online. 
Uh, but we know that your devices, both for students, teachers, and administrators, those devices are crucial right now, whether it's a cell phone, a smartphone, an iPhone, a, a pad, you know, an iPad, a Google Chromebook, a laptop, whatever it is. Those are so important and so vital. So two things. One, it, it probably bears letting you know if anybody out there watching doesn't have access to a, a technical you know, device and you need it, let us know. If you need a computer, if you need a laptop, if you need a, a, a notebook, you know, and you don't have one and you're struggling, let us know. We can figure that out. We can help you. But two, next week during worship service, we're going to invite all the students and teachers and school administrators and school workers to join us for a very special blessing of the devices. That's what I'm going to call it instead of backpacks where we're gonna offer a word of prayer for all of those who are getting ready to enter into a new school year so that you know that your Calvary family is praying for you. So we invite you to join us next week in worship for that and bring those devices. If you have a tablet or a laptop or a phone, bring them with you uh, and we will offer our prayers over that. So with that in mind, I invite us now to join together in our opening hymn. So this morning, we continue with the series we've been working on about what the church is, what it is to us in our lives. So far, the church is the place where we've encountered Jesus, both individually and collectively and corporately as an institution. What makes us unique and different from the rest of the world is that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Then the church worshiped what brings us together what unites us is this idea that we worship god we worship god together and we worship god in our lives each and every day we are encouraged to lead a life of worship today we're going to think and reflect on how the church prays we pray for ourselves we pray for one another and we pray for the world. That is both a blessing and an honor. The opportunity to calm ourselves, to settle our minds, and to communicate with our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. That's a, a blessing and, and a unique opportunity that we have each and every day. So I asked at the beginning for us to get your updated information because one of the things I'd like to start here at Calvary is a weekly church prayer email. For the last six months we've been apart and yet I know that there are people in and among us who need prayer. What's that song? It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. We need prayer. You need prayer. I need prayer. The people around us, our communities and our world need prayer. And we need to remind each other of those among us who are in need, who need a prayer of healing, a prayer of compassion, 
a prayer of love, of acceptance, of joy. And so I'm going to invite you, I believe that my email is going to be on the screen, and I'm going to invite you, you also have Reverend Jorinda's email address, I'm going to invite you to email prayer requests to us so that we can send them out and your church family, both near and far, can be keeping you or those people in your lives in their prayers. I want to remind you that sometimes there are things that you need that are sensitive. Maybe it's something that you need to share with one of us as a pastor, but you don't want it shared with everybody else. We can do that too. You know, email Reverend Larry or email myself or Matt or Dorinda, and we as a pastoral team can be praying for you, even if you don't want it shared with everyone. We get that. And sometimes it's just a name. Sometimes it's, hey, my grandmother Esther needs prayer. Sometimes there's a reason. My son needs prayer as he enters in this new kindergarten year, as he sits in front of a screen every day. Whether it's just a name or whether you have an explanation, we invite you to share that with us so that we can continue to share that with your family as we are apart, but we will continue it once we're back together. So today the church prays, and as we prepare our hearts to worship, I invite and your attention to the screen and help us to center ourselves with this visual illustration. Church, would you pray with me? Most holy and gracious God, as always, we thank you for gathering us together. We thank you for the opportunity in the midst of our crazy, busy lives to stop and to focus on you, to listen for your call on our lives and in our hearts, and to reorient ourselves to your will for us in the world. Inspire us in these moments and in our days ahead that we might truly be made better disciples so that our minds and our attention and our vision is grounded and fixed on you. We offer these, our prayers, in the name of your Son. Amen. Now let us continue by singing our hymn theme song for the series, We Are the Church.
are the church. And now, as the church, I invite all the young people to come to the screen. Like I say each week, this is the moment where I tell my kids, sit down, be quiet. It's time to pay attention because it's the children's sermon. Both those who are young by age and those who are young at heart join us now. So we are talking about prayer today. And so I want to teach us all a way to pray that helps us. Maybe we don't know how to pray. Maybe you think, oh, I, I want to pray, but I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know what words to use. I don't know how to talk to God. Well, I'm going to give you a way of talking to God. And trust me when I say God does not care what words you use as long as you open your heart to God. So everybody here at home, everybody in place, I want you to take your left hand and hold it up like this. Spread out those fingers. This is called the five finger prayer. This is a way to pray. So the first finger that you're holding up is your thumb, right? It's the one closest to you when you're holding your hand up. So you're going to start your prayer by praying for those who are closest to you. Maybe these are your family, the people that live in your homes. Maybe this is your neighbors or your friends, your best friends, your BFFs, the people that you love, that surround you with love. Pray for them. Now, the next finger is your pointer finger, and you use your pointer finger to point if you're showing someone where to go and what direction to go. So, your pointer finger reminds you to pray for the people who point you in the right direction. Maybe these are your teachers. Maybe these are also your parents. Maybe these are your uh, older siblings or your older friends or your pastors, the people that show you where to go and how to live. Now, the next finger is your middle finger. Don't put that up by itself. The middle finger is the tallest finger. So the middle finger reminds you to pray for the leaders, the tallest not physically, the leaders in your life. Maybe the leaders are your pastor. Maybe the leaders are your principals. Maybe the leaders are your mayor or your city officials. Maybe the leaders are your president. Maybe the leaders are the leaders of the world. We're going to pray for the leaders around us. Then the ring finger. Did you know that the ring finger is the weakest finger? Out of all five, that ring finger is the weakest. So the ring finger reminds us to pray for those who are weak among us, those who are hungry, those who are struggling, those who are sad, those who are sick, those who are alone. And then finally, your pinky finger. That's going to remind you to pray for yourself. To pray that God is with you, that God guides you, and as a reminder that God loves you. So, here's your hand. Your thumb is those closest to you. Your pointer is those who point you in the right direction. Your middle finger is the leaders in your life. The ring finger are the weak in your life. And your pinky is for yourself. So I want to encourage you kids to try and do this once a day. Do your five-finger prayer when you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed, before dinner, before lunch, whenever. And get your parents and have them do it with you. And this is a way you can offer prayer. So let's pray together. God, we are so grateful for the people who love us, who take care of us, who are with us always. And we ask for prayers for them and help us to love them and take care of them in return. God, we, we thank you and we pray for those who point us in the right direction, those who show us how to live, those who guide us, show us how to make decisions, show us how to learn and grow and be better people and be better disciples. God, we pray for our leaders for the leaders of our schools and our church, for the leaders of our community and our state, for the leaders of our country and our world. God, we pray for them. 
for their hearts, for their minds, and for their continued work. God, we pray for those who are weak, those who are struggling, those who have lost hope, who are burdened with sadness, whose hearts are breaking, whose bellies are empty, who live alone. Be with them, love them, encourage them. And God, we pray for ourselves, that we might open our hearts and listen for you each and every day, that we might make good decisions, that we might work hard, try our best, and to share your love and joy with the world each and every day. These are our prayers that we offer in the name of Jesus and with the power of the Holy Spirit and all of God's children together said, Amen. Kids, thank you. I love you. I miss you. And I can't wait to meet all of you. Today we are blessed with the beauty of Mark and his magnificent voice who has come to share his talent with us. Would you open our hearts, your hearts, and let him inspire us in these moments. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and to bid me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has often found relief and all escaped the tempter's snare by thy return sweet hour Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the joys I feel, the bliss I share, of those whose anxious spirits burn with strong desires for thy return. With such I hasten to this place where God my Savior showed his face and gladly take my station there and wait for thee, sweet hour. Oh. 
Here, here, here. Well, I think it's my first time speaking so far this morning, so let me just say good morning, church. It is a joy to be able to worship with you this morning as we center our thoughts, center our spiritual practices on prayer. And as we do that, we come to a time of conversation, so we're going to talk about talking to God. And as I thought about that, I thought, well, let's see what Jesus talked about when he talked about talking to God. So I want to invite you to to join me in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, where Jesus says this, And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your God who is in secret, and your God who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your God who knows what you need before you ask, for your God knows what you need before you ask. Pray then this way, Jesus tells us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Creator will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, Neither will your Creator forgive your trespasses. So I don't know about my friends up here, but every time I am tasked with leading prayer in worship or in a public setting, which happens a lot for those of us who have have been in leadership positions in the church, even if you go to a family outing, somebody says, well, you can pray in public, so why don't you pray for this meal? (laughs) Happens all the time. And no matter the situation, no matter the scenario, my thought always goes to this passage. I always think about Jesus saying, don't be like those hypocrites who like to stand up and pray in public, but go into secret. And that always gives me a moment of pause. And if I was being honest, it, it always makes me a little uneasy to pray in public. I don't, I don't know. So Matt, I got to tell you though, um, it makes you uneasy to pray in public. I... When I was in college, I had a pastor at my home church at Garden City, and I don't remember most of what he taught, but I remember one sermon where he said, I must have been home for you know break or summer or something, and he was talking in a sermon, and he said, if you are asked to pray in front of other people, if you're put on the spot and somebody says, would you pray in front of one or two or a group or in public, and you don't want to or you're uncomfortable, then that means you don't pray enough on your own. That you should have such a deep, intentional prayer life that at any point in time somebody calls on you, you should be ready to pray at any moment, no matter what the circumstances. And so that stuck with me to develop an intentional prayer life so that all those times that somebody calls on me to pray, I'm ready at any moment to offer prayers on behalf of others. Yeah, I, I, I get the, I, I'm not sure I 100% agree. Okay. Because right. I, I, I understand the idea of cultivating an intentional prayer practice, and I, I know that, that as you practice something, you get more comfortable with it. But I, I even, as, even in those moments where I feel like I have a decent personal prayer practice, I still get comfortable praying in front of people. And, and I, I don't know exactly why that is, and maybe, maybe there's something internal, some more internal work I could do, but, but I think, as I think about it, like, the idea of, of prayer is, is, is almost a burden as, as church leaders. As we, as we lead people, it's almost, it's, it's so important, it's, it's so heavy to, to be able to lead people in their connection with God, that, that I, I, I feel that burden in a way that I think I'm, makes me... I would preach a million sermons before I wanted to lead a pastoral prayer because of that. Because I mean, I think, it's so important. How many times do you think Jesus prayed? You if you went pray? through all of Scripture, how many times do you think Jesus prayed? Yeah. Larry, how many? Well, I think 
whenever you read scripture, it only captures some of those moments. Okay, but how many times do life. they refer? Well, I would think there's probably a reference of at least a dozen to 20 mm -hmm. times. Okay, a dozen to 20. Kids. Yeah. Brian? Brian only knows how many times Jesus sang. Leave him alone. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he said low. He said low. Reverend Jorinda, what, what did you say? A lot. A lot. Reverend Jorinda says a lot. What do you think, Matt? Give me. I, a... I'm with Brian. I would go. I would go Less than a dozen end. to yeah. twenty. Thirty-nine times they reference Jesus in prayer. So if Jesus needs to pray, we need to pray. Yeah, Reverend but, Jorinda won the so, answer. So Jorinda, if it was Price is Right, yeah. she gets the jeopardy. <laughs> uh, I, I would add to this conversation that I think, Matt, part of your uncomfortableness comes when people who are asking you to pray treat it as if it's something that is just part of what should be done regardless mm. of whether or not they care about prayer. Mm. I think there is times in the church as well as in society where it's like, oh yeah, we have to do a prayer. We have no clue why. We have no relationship to what that prayer might do or relate to or why we are involved with even a prayer life. And I think that makes, at least in my experience, an uncomfortableness that they're treating it like a rote, this is what we are supposed to do regardless of whether we understand it or know what in the world it is. And, and, and there's the time. So, yeah. I, I agree, and I think pastors are as guilty of that as others. I, uh, I, I, absolutely. I, the number of times I've heard pastoral prayers that, that function more like sermons than prayers. And, and so as, as we're thinking about prayer and, and thinking about the purpose of prayer, not just for us as individuals, but for us as a community, um, that, that shapes our thinking and then shapes how we pray. Mm. So for me, I was thinking about what, what does prayer do for me? And so the, the, the best illustration that I could come up with was this. If, for anybody here, if you have a device, a phone, a tablet, a computer, that's not working right, what is the first thing that somebody asks you to do? Well, Larry calls somebody else. Yeah, Larry, yeah, yeah. Larry calls like, somebody else. help me. Yeah, that's right. And what's the first thing that they would say to you then? They would say, have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? A reboot. A reboot. Yep. And for me, I think that's how prayer has functioned in my life. As a moment where if if I'm stressed, if I'm anxious, if I'm angry, if I am not myself or I am overwhelmed, I need to reboot. And for prayer becomes that moment of turning things off, of, of shutting it down, focusing my heart and my spirit on, on God's voice, and in that way, turning it back on again, um, refocusing. And, I, and I, this point was made clear to me this week. I, I don't get to watch movies very often that aren't for children. Um, <laughs> But I had a chance to watch the recent biopic about Harriet Tubman, um, oh, which yeah. just an astounding story. The movie was great. I think the story of Harriet Tubman, apart from the movie, is just phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. But in, in the movie, they, they depict this, this um, thing that happened to Harriet Tubman where she would, have, she would kind of have these prayerful visions at, at, at random moments. And, and sometimes it what seemed to be inopportune moments when she was leading leading people to freedom and 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 she would stop and she took them so seriously uh and she took what she was receiving from god in those moments so seriously and so for her that was that moment of of doing this essential work she was still focusing on where god was leading and that that kind of prayer practice of turning it off and turning it back on again mm. i i just found that so inspiring so for me um my personal prayer practices are a lot about that, about quieting my heart and my soul to hear what God has to say. And then as we think about how prayer affects us as a community, that's, that's what I'm drawn to. And there's an Oswald Chambers quote. He says this, he says, to say that prayer changes things is not as close to the truth as saying, prayer changes me, then I change things. Yeah, there you go. God has established things so that prayer on the basis of redemption changes the way a person looks at things. So I think that's true for us as a community. To say that prayer changes things is not so much as saying prayer changes us. The way that we pray and worship collectively, the way that we pray for one another, it changes us so that we as a community can go out into the world and change things for the better. So as we think about prayer, that's, 
That's where my heart is, is how do we allow God's Spirit through the practice of prayer to shape our priorities, to shape our focus as a community, and really transform us. So I, as I pray for you all this week, will be thinking about how we can be transformed as a community through prayer. You know, you know Matt, uh, most of us, at least those that are in professional uh, positions, often have to-do lists. In fact, a lot of time management magazines would, uh, and or gurus would say you need to have a list. And, and the percentage of getting the things accomplished that are written down on a list is extremely higher than if you don't have one. What I just heard you say is that a faithful prayer life literally can help you to create that list in the first place, mm -hmm. as well as prioritize that list and to make it more faithful, if you will, as a disciple of Christ in our day-to-day -day activities. I, I, wanna, I wanna build on what you, yeah. what you just shared about when it comes to prayer. Um, and, and I have a, a couple of short texts that have led me in our uh, experiences as prayer lives. Um, and, and the Apostle Paul, in, in most part, captures these. He, he points out towards the end of the uh, communication to the Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Pray constantly. And, and the second portion, desire, I desire then, and this is in Timothy, as he writes to a young pastor, Paul at the time, I desire then that in every place that we should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or arguments. I, I, I would like to add to what you've just said that for some of us, it's very important to have a certain time of the day or maybe even a certain place that we resonate with to assist us in our prayer life. But I think there's another component of prayer, no matter how many times you do it, that it's everywhere at all times. Um, if I had to use a phrase, I'd say I find myself some days having a prayer long day in conversations with God that maybe aren't flowerful in the language or eloquent in its delivery, but there's a conversation. And, and, and sometimes it's far from the flowery language. It's, it's a debate. It's an argument. Mm. I mean, much like you would find in the scriptures in different locations where you know, I'm not sure. What do you mean by, you know, what? And many people would not define that as prayer. And, and I think that's a mistake. I think that everywhere, at all times, it's quite clear that there is a prayer time, but there's also a prayer life. And I, and I see prayer often in that category. And, and then finally, I, I'll finish with a text that, uh, that captures out of 1 Peter, uh, are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing psalms of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call on the elders of the church and have them pray over them. The prayer of faith will help the sick and help others to be raised up. I, I have felt the power of prayer personally the last couple of weeks, of course. And um, as an example of all that, we're at the middle of the service for my own mother and uh, the pastor at Christ Church, Chris Morgan, the lead pastor there, uh, had, did his homework and, and was sharing how my mother always had a devotional. She had a guidepost, a daily devotional at her bedside. She would always have certain readings and, and she did stitching on the walls where she had things from the scriptures, you know, reminders of a prayerful life. And I said to Chris, when it was a uh, turn for the family to speak, that there was also a side of my mother that was very prayerful whenever things happened. So I was recalling, she had raised three boys. You don't raise three boys without grit and courage and stamina. And I remembered a day I said, and just as an example, we found a huge garden snake down over the hill in our garden, and we decided, wouldn't it be great to bring this and show mom? I, and I remember this like it was yesterday. And the three of us bring the, and this was a big snake. Bring this up to the front door because we think it's cool to show mom. 
So we show mom, and sure enough, the thing gets loose, and it takes off into the house, into the living room. Well, my mother went to prayer. Her first words were, oh, Jesus! And, and I can remember times throughout her life when she would enter into that prayer time, maybe not in the way you might in a church, but, oh, Jesus! And, and, and she would have a conversation with God. And, and so I just I want to lift up the fact that frequently prayer is difficult for people because they see it as some sort of eloquent presentation. And I think it's far from that. And so I not only agree with the two of you that there's different expressions about uh, the kinds of prayers or how you might see, but I think there's one constant foundational piece, and that's everybody uh, has the ability to pray everywhere at all times and should practice it constantly. Because like you said, prayer is a conversation and the beauty is we all have access to God at any moment, at any time, at any day. And we can engage in that conversation at any time. And the conversation, sometimes it's talking. It's talking at God, it's talking to God, but it's also allowing God to speak to us in return. And listen, that's right. That oftentimes our prayers become a list of what we want, what we need, our burdens, the burdens of people around us. And we need to leave space, intentional space, for God to respond, for God to speak, for God to move in us and with us. So if prayer is a conversation, it's also a dialogue. If you look up the definition of dialogue, it's a conversation of more than two people. And so when prayer changes us, it also changes the people around us, that engaging in a dialogue with God and with others so that our lives are centered and grounded on that. But if prayer is a conversation, where do we start? Like I mentioned in the children's sermon, for some of us, maybe prayer doesn't come naturally. Maybe we're really good at meditation or at breathing exercises. Jeremiah is learning some breathing exercises to help him through his emotions, you know, deep breaths. But how do we transition those deep breaths into a conversation with God that opens ourselves up and allows God to respond? Well, I think we should start small. So would you watch this visual illustration and ground yourself in prayer. It's so bright out I can't feel a thing Who we are we are now I know I'll never 
As we mentioned a little earlier, Kelly's going to lead an effort weekly uh, with Jorinda and, of course, Matt and I as well to, to what your prayer requests are and to help send them out among the family of faith. And uh, those that are more private and more, um, if we shall say, personal, then we will do that as well as a pastoral team. So please send and let us know. Uh, one of the mentors in my life when it came to prayer is Ross McKenzie. He happened to be the worship leader at Chautauqua for many, many years. And he was a mentor for me to understand how public prayer and the poetry related to public prayer could help impact and help people unpack the purpose of prayer and the power of prayer. So I turn today for our prayer to uh, one of his books called The Threads, uh, that he related to the threads of uh, communications and prayerful life with God. 
So let me turn to his, his words. When it seems as if our lives are a Shakespearean play done by a third-rate touring company, and it's so hard to find the beauty in the middle, well, look at it again. What should be sublime is marred or messed. Why had we no time to rehearse this part? Why do heroes at times act like fuel, fools? And why has the sacred been made to look so seedy? Why can we never penetrate the inner core of things? Where was the poetry? And where has the poetry gone? The pride of character, where is it? The curtain couldn't come down on a moment too soon. But let us pray. Lord, show us that your treasure lies hidden in every field. Your beauty is for the finding in any mud or mess. Show us, my God, that we too have a role in all that happens around us. Not just the walk on part of those who simply watch and wonder, waiting for the final curtain. No, show us what it is to have an active role, to be actors in the dramatic work in which you have assigned our parts, in bringing mercy, virtue, peace to those who need and long to have our voice, our gift, our caress, and prompt us all again to make each action on our part an occasion for your grace to be present and help us to answer to all of your cues. Amen. It is part of our time together as well to share our gifts and our treasures, and today is no different. I want to give thanks to those who continue to so faithfully send and or use PayPal to help support the ministry here at Calvary. I want to lift a particular request this week, though. Our mission team, uh, Kathy and Bud Wagner, are working on this to go out officially next week. But we're asking some extra help. If you're able to make an extra gift over the month of September, we have a number of identities that have called out and are asking for our, our gifts. One is the Northside Common Ministries. Their food cupboard and bank has been quite overused and is getting in great need of more support. Another is our own Kids Meal Network this summer. Even though, for the time being, we've stopped serving meals, waiting to see what schools and what other needs there are, I need to say that in 19 locations in the last 14 weeks, not the usual 10 or 9 that we have previously, we have doubled the number of meals that have been given to children in areas of poverty in Allegheny County and beyond. The most recent numbers is it appears as if we have spent over and delivered 30,000 meals in those 14 weeks. We need to make sure that we're able to pay the vendors and help secure funding uh, if we need to continue in the next couple of weeks. Part of your gift will go to the Northside Common Ministries. Part of your gift will go to Kids Meal Network. And the third and final portion Weeks ago, Reverend Stephanie Gottschalk was with us and asked us to assist with the ministries in the Bahamas. Some of them are still recovering from hurricanes, and some are constantly recovering from poverty and the needs, basic needs of human living. So our plea is not only a, a gracious thank you for all the gifts that come every week here at Calvary, but to consider in the weeks ahead, in the month of September in particular, a little extra gift that may help those missions local and beyond the borders of our own communities. Let us give thanks. Gracious God, whether these gifts come in the form of a check or 
and currency. Whether these gifts come electronically in our world today, or whether they come by the gifts of time and talent with our hands and our hearts. We want to pause in these moments and give thanks for these gifts and ask that with your blessings, they may continue to touch and help to heal and to provide an expression of hope and of love and of faith. We ask of your blessings, Lord, this day and always. And everyone said, Amen. I think we have a uh, hymn, uh, a song for the closing of our service today, and let us share. As we prepare to go into the week in a spirit of prayer, one quick reminder from Reverend Kelly. She still has a couple of Zoom um, chances left if you want to get to know her as we as a community are still welcoming her into the Calvary family. Um, so I think that information will be available. One thing we haven't mentioned with prayer is the posture of prayer. Um, something that I, I learned from some Buddhist friends who, who meditate, is that posture can have an impact on how we pray. So as we, as we enter our benediction prayer time, I want to invite you at home to, to assume a posture of prayer, whatever that means for you, however you are able um, to do that, whether that means bowing your head and closing your eyes, whether that means standing with me, whether it means kneeling. Assume a posture of prayer as we leave with this prayer as a benediction. Lord, make us instruments of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in forgiving that we are forgiven. It is in dying to self that we are born to eternal life. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>